Hinduism in the balance of its original teachings, reason, and sound natural disposition question and answer part 1. In the name of Allah, praise be to Allah, and may Allah's peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad and his family, companions, and those who follow him. To proceed. Hinduism may be a religion, but to be more accurate, it is a way of life. Followers of Hinduism account for 15% of the world population, numbering more than 1.2 billion. Hinduism has undergone a lot of change over time. In the post vedas era, Hinduism was being filled with problems related to intellectual, scientific, and natural disposition, some of which we will address in this book. Yes. Hinduism went far away from the original teachings of the Vedas, the original sources of Hinduism, and followed the teachings of people, monks, and Bhagavad Gita and esoteric tantras. In this short book, I will try to judge the current Hinduism according to reason, modern science, logic, and the original Vedas teachings, which still exist among Hinduists to this day. I am certain that the remnants of the truth in the Vedas and in the Fitra, natural disposition, of Hinduists are sufficient to safely lead a Hinduist to the true religion. The Vedas are the holiest scriptures in Hinduism ever. Natural disposition, it is the motive that prompts one to consider the purpose of his existence and his consequence, and it directs this motive towards belief in Allah and servitude to him based on his legislations. The true religion, it is the message that comprises the remnants of the truth in the Vedas, and it is a call of the natural disposition, which is an inspiration of Allah to all humankind. It is the message reflecting the signs of belief in Allah's oneness in the teachings of Upanishad. I will try, in this little book, to hold a short comparison between the Hinduism at the time of the Vedas and today's Hinduism. Indeed, Hinduism has changed immensely. It has gone extremely far away from the remnants of the pure and untainted monotheistic teachings in the Vedas. Current Hinduism comprises the belief of pantheism, the unity of existence. As the Creator unites with the creation, thus created beings become themselves the Creator. Not only does this strange belief contradict the explicit teachings of the Vedas, but it also runs counter to intellectual axioms. How is it possible that the deity resides in everything, and then you, O Hinduist, seek to reach him through a group of certain rites and practices, while he originally exists in you? Is this not an obvious intellectual paradox? Furthermore, the belief in the unity of existence entails the relativity of the truth, then all religions that worship idols or stones should be worshipping God. For God, according to this creed, is that idol or stone, as he resides in everything and he is everything. The relativity of the truth destroys the meaning and value, as I will explain in this book. Added to the foregoing is the fact that the Vedas explicitly call for belief in the God who is separate from his creation. These creatures are created by Allah, and his creation cannot encompass him in order for him to reside in them. The Vedas, specifically the Rig Veda, says, O Allah, both the sun and the universe cannot encompass or contain you. HTM, 22, the website is affiliated to a Buddhist magazine that provides informative research on Buddhism and its rituals. This is a clear proof in the Vedas for the falsity of the belief in the unity of existence, for indeed Allah is separate from his creation. In today's Hinduism, we find the belief in soul transmigration, as the souls of people are believed to move, after death, to other beings, to reborn in other new living beings. So, every human being has a previous life in another living being, and so on. This creed generates a lot of problems. If, for example, soul transmigration were right, why does a newborn not possess the same mental faculties like adults? Kogan, Robert. 1998, Critical Thinking, Step by Step, University Press of America, pages 202-203. Hindus perform old religious rituals called Shraddha, and they are aimed at calming the souls of the dead. How would the souls migrate while they reside in the dead? Another belief of today's Hinduism is karma. According to karma, people are born as a result of their previous deeds. Whoever was evil is born into a new life belonging to a lower caste or suffering more afflictions. Therefore, Hindus consider the affliction of any person as a result of the sins he committed in a previous life. This erroneous vague conception ruins the life in its entirety. It does not do any good to humanity, rather, it determines that the suffering of people is a normal punishment for crimes they perpetrated in their previous lives. This is a kind of reconciliation among backwardness, oppression, and social discrimination. But the bigger problem is, where does this karma creed exist in the Vedas? 
The Vedas state that there is paradise and hell, which Allah gives to people in accordance with their deeds, and they do not speak about new births in other beings. The Rig Veda says, Make me eternal in the place where all kinds of enjoyment and pleasure are stored, and where you give all what the souls desire. The Rig Veda, Mandala, 9, Sukta, 113. Mantra, 9 to 11. Another of the primary creeds in today's Hinduism is the pursuit to get rid of repeated births and soul transmigration and to reach a phase known as Tant Moksha, in which a person unites with their divine essence. But this idea rests upon a very pessimistic outlook on existence, as the purpose of existence becomes an attempt to get rid of the existence. This idea is actually dangerous to society, since it strips man of any scruple or fear. No matter how many immoralities he engages in, he will be reborn and will inevitably attain salvation in a future birth. This utterly contradicts the teachings of the Vedas, which stipulate that a wrongdoer and sinner will be punished in a place particularly prepared for them. The Rig Veda says, a very deep bottomless place for sinners. Rig Veda, Mandala, 4, Sukta, 5, Mantra, 5. So, how can this place be reconciled with the idea of the repeated births? As for the most famous scientific problem for today's Hinduism, it is its view of the universe's origin. It assumes that the universe dissolves and then forms and then dissolves and forms in a process that has no end. This is an odd scientific error that runs counter to modern science. It is well known that modern science has established that this universe has an absolute beginning and was not preceded by other universes. Scientifically, the universe was created and originated in an unprecedented manner. This is, however, the same creed existing in the Vedas, which states that there is a worldly life that emerged all of a sudden and there is an afterlife. However, in the philosophies that appeared later in Hinduism, like Puranas, there came the explicit view that the universe is eternal and gets repeated. Today's Hinduism contradicts the creed of the Vedas, modern science, and the religion of Islam, which contains the truth spoken by the Vedas. According to the Muslim creed, which Allah has revealed in the Noble Quran, the universe emerged in an unprecedented manner. In his book, Allah Almighty says, the originator of the heavens and earth. When he decrees a matter, he only says to it, be, and it is. Surah al baqarah 117. So, According to Islam, the universe was created, i.e., it emerged in an unprecedented manner. This is the result ultimately reached by science and was told by someone who worked as a shepherd 1,400 years ago. Scientifically, the universe was created and originated in an unprecedented manner. This is, however, the same creed existing in the Vedas, which states that there is a worldly life that emerged all of a sudden and there is an afterlife. However, in the philosophies that appeared later in Hinduism, like Puranas, there came the explicit view that the universe is eternal and gets repeated. Today's Hinduism contradicts the creed of the Vedas, modern science, and the religion of Islam, which contains the truth spoken by the Vedas. According to the Muslim creed, which Allah has revealed in the Noble Quran, the universe emerged in an unprecedented manner. In his book, Allah Almighty says, the originator of the heavens and earth. When he decrees a matter, he only says to it, be, and it is. Allah is the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is in them, and there is nothing in creation that is like him. If he decrees and wills something, he only says to it be and it is as he willed it. Nothing can stop his command and his decree. Surah al baqarah 117. So, according to Islam, the universe was created, i.e., it emerged in an unprecedented manner. This is the result ultimately reached by science and was told by someone who worked as a shepherd 1,400 years ago, called Muhammad ibn Abdullah. He is the messenger of Allah and the prophet of Islam. I discuss in this book many of the problems facing Hinduism, and offer, on the other hand, the view of Islam on the universe, life, the reward and punishment, and the purpose of existence, which totally agrees with natural disposition and the remnants of the Veda. I will also point out how Islam provides the most accurate, reliable, and perfect example in fulfilling people's need to know how to live and explain the meaning and purpose of human existence in a way consistent with natural disposition, reason, and science. Moreover, the book presents some proofs for the trueness of the Islamic religion and the prophecies about its coming in the Veda. Indeed, the Vedas told about the future emergence of Islam and Prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, and called upon Hindus to believe in him. Islam is not merely a religion on earth like other religions, rather, it is the only monotheistic religion with which Allah Almighty sent all prophets. All prophets were sent to call people to monotheism, and none of the religions maintain pure and untainted monotheism today except for Islam. All other religions, on the other hand, have some share of polytheism, be it small or large. Allah does not accept a religion from people other than Islam. In the Quran, he says, anyone who seeks a religion other than Islam, never will it be accepted from him, and in the hereafter he will be among the losers. Whoever seeks a path other than that which Allah has endorsed, the path of surrendering, Islam, it will not be accepted from them by Allah.
they will be of those who have lost their souls by entering the fire of hell. Surat al Imran, 85. Islam is the religion with which Allah Almighty sent all prophets and messengers. The primary feature in Islam is that it has the meaning of submission to Allah, worshipping Him alone, and negating any embodiment of Allah in idols or stones, like the case in today's Hinduism. In conclusion, the book shows how a person can be submissive to Allah, and explains the meaning of Islam and the necessity of this religion. Let us begin the journey of this book, with Allah's blessing. 1. What is Hinduism? Hinduism is a religion, or more accurately, a way of life, that comprises a group of rituals, acts of worship, scriptures, and concepts on the universe and the existence. Studying Hinduism, by Arvind Sharma, untranslated. Hinduism formed over long centuries and through complex collections of doctrines that allow for a diverse and sometimes contradictory belief system, and modern Hinduism finds nothing wrong about that. For it does not possess a single creed or reference or a binding text to which people can refer for judgment. Although the Vedas are the holiest books in Hinduism ever, Hindus, as we will demonstrate in this book, came to contradict them so greatly that Hinduism now accepts various conceptions and divergent ideas that have no relation to the earliest Vedas era. All in all, Hinduism aims at getting rid of suffering, and we will explain later how to do so according to the Hindus' concept and how they contradict the Vedic creed with regard to salvation, which has much remnants of the truth. Hinduism, Belief and Practice, by Jinin D. Fowler, untranslated. 2. How did this religion originate with this intertwinement? Hinduism means India, India, the state, the climate, the history, the intertwinement, and the traditions. So, it is a religion almost restricted to India, where about 95% of the world's Hindus live. Hinduism emerged on the basis of the earliest Vedas, yet, unfortunately, it merged with certain philosophies, beliefs, books, and notions that formed over centuries. At a later post-Vedas stage, Hinduism followed the teachings of hermits, tantras, and Bhagavad Gita. Nearly from 1500 BC to 500 AD, many of these concepts and philosophies pushed against and overcame the Vedas, to the extent that we no longer see on the ground anything but these concepts and philosophies. 3. What is the Hindu's belief specifically? Modern-day Hinduism is a creed that believes in a large number of deities. Hindus, nonetheless, believe in Allah, the One God. They believe that God resides in all these formulated items that they hold sacred. Some people may think that the Hindus' belief in one God and their view of these statues and formulated items as images of God is not idolatry. This is a clear error. Regarding statues as images of the one God is the very basis of the pagan belief that contradicts the teachings of prophets and the Vedas throughout the history of humanity. All polytheists who contradicted the prophets and the Vedic teachings did believe in Allah. They, however, regarded idols as representation of God. So, the belief of polytheists in the existence and oneness of Allah does not negate their disbelief in him, his prophets, and the disbelief in the Vedas, as long as they adopt such idols. The Vedas explicitly and categorically prohibit people from taking idols, seeking closeness to them, or holding them sacred. The Veda says, he who worships, apart from Allah, manufactured things will drown in the depths of darkness and taste the punishment of the fire for endless ages. Yajaveda, Sukta, 40, Mantra, 9. So, whoever takes these idols, with which Hinduism abounds today, will, according to the Veda, remain eternally in hell. The Veda also says, the owner of all, the knower of the unseen, who does not need the assistance of other gods, that is Allah who deserves to be worshipped by man. Those who take other gods apart from Allah are the miserable, and they will always face dreadful major disasters. The Rig Veda, Mandala, 1, Sukta, 7, Mantra, 9. The Bhagavad Gita also says, those who worship the deities will gain the deities, those who worship the ancestors will gain the ancestors, those who worship the devil will gain the devil, and those who worship me will find me. The Bhagavad Gita, 9-25. These and numerous other texts explicitly enjoin the Hindus to believe in the oneness of Allah and abandon these idols. Mahashti Dainan Saraswati said, there is not a single letter in the Vedas pointing to the worship of idols made of stones and other things. Hindus did not abandon the monotheistic belief in the Vedas except through false teachings that came at a later time. The Noble Quran, which Allah Almighty revealed to his prophet Muhammad, affirms that those who worship idols allege that they believe in Allah, the One God, and nonetheless, they because of taking these idols, are considered as disbelievers in Allah. In the Quran, Allah Almighty says, O Messenger! If you ask these idolaters, who created the heavens and who created the earth, they will say, Allah created them. Say to them, to show them the inability of their gods. Tell me about these idols that you worship besides Allah. If Allah willed to harm me, do they have the power to remove that harm from me? Or if my Lord wished to grant me mercy from him, are they able to stop his mercy from me? Say to them, Allah alone is enough for me. 
It is on him that I rely in all my affairs. It is on him alone those who want to place their reliance and trust their affairs to. Surat az 38. He also says, if you ask them who created them, they will surely say, Allah. And if you ask them, who created you, they would definitely say, Allah created us, so how can they then turn away from his worship after this acknowledgement? Surat az 87. So, taking these idols makes one a disbeliever in Allah, according to both the Quran and the Vedas. Allah Almighty says in his book, you worship nothing besides Allah but idols and fabricate lies. Those whom you worship besides Allah have no power to give you provision. So seek provision from Allah, worship Him, and be grateful to Him. To Him you will all be returned. O oh, idolaters, you are only worshipping idols which do not benefit or harm, and you are inventing a lie when you claim they are worthy of worship. Those whom you worship besides Allah do not have the ability to provide for you that they should provide you. Seek provision from Allah alone, as He is the provider, worship Him alone, and thank Him for the provision He has blessed you with. To him alone you will be returned on the day of judgment to be reckoned and rewarded, not to your idols. Surat al 17. So, we should seek provision from Allah and worship him, for he is the one to whom we will all return. Nothing still adheres to the belief in Allah's oneness and the abandonment of all forms of polytheism on earth today but Islam. Therefore, every Hindu should consider Islam unbiasedly, with insight, and look into the creed of monotheism in Islam and consider whether or not it accords with his natural disposition and the Vedic teachings. The mission with which Allah sent all prophets to humankind is to devote worship to Allah alone and this would happen by rejecting all idols and submitting to what was brought by the messengers of Allah and the final prophet Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. 4. How did the idea of the embodiment of the one God through scores of idols emerge in Hinduism? The major problem with modern Hinduism, after the Vedic era, is the assumption that the numerous attributes of God necessitates the existence of numerous essences, i.e. numerous deities. They assume that every divine attribute has an idol representing it. So, in their belief, the Creator has become Brahma, the Creator of the Universe, Vishnu, the Preserver of the Universe, Shiva, the Destroyer of the Universe. The Rider Encyclopedia of Eastern Philosophy and Religion, by Stephen Schumacher, p. 397. This is an assumption that contradicts the axioms based on reason and natural disposition and runs counter to the teachings of the Vedas. Plurality of attributes does not entail plurality of essences. A person can be intelligent, strong, and polite. His numerous traits do not entail possessing numerous essences. An intelligent person is himself the strong one and himself the polite one. To Allah belongs the most exalted example. The Vedas affirm this truth. It is stated in the Rig Veda, they call him Indra, Mitra, Varana, Agni, and he is heavenly nobly winged Gar Atman. The sages call the one God with different titles. Numerous are the texts in the Vedas that mention Allah by various names and attributes. The names and attributes belong to the one essence. This is the concept adopted by the earliest Vedas and the Muslim creed. In Islam, Allah Almighty possesses the excellent names and sublime attributes. He, exalted be he, says, and your God is one God. None has the right to be worshipped except him the most compassionate, the most merciful. O oh people, your Allah is the true Allah, the one, unique in his essence and attributes. There is no other true God, and he is the merciful and his mercy is vast. He is compassionate with his creation, surrounding them with many blessings. Surat al-Baqarah, 163. So, Allah is the most compassionate one, and he is the most merciful one. In another verse, he says, He is Allah, the one whom there is no true deity except him, he is the knower of the absent and the present, nothing is hidden from him. The benevolent of the world and the afterlife and their merciful, his mercy encompasses the worlds, the master, the pure and sacred from every deficiency, the faultless from every defect. The corroborator of his messengers with manifest signs, the observer of the actions of his servants, the almighty whom no one can overpower. The omnipotent who controls everything through his power, the imperious. Pure and glorified is he from the idols and other things the idolaters ascribe to him. Surat al-Hasha, 22-23 Indeed, these numerous names and attributes belong to Allah, the one God. The other problem with the idea of embodying God in different idols is that the universe enjoys no security with such paganism. Hence, the Noble Quran negates all these idolatrous conceptions about Allah and emphasizes that taking other gods with Allah entails lack of security for the entire universe. If there had been gods besides Allah in the heavens and earth, both realms would have fallen in disorder. Glory be to Allah, Lord of the throne, far above what they ascribe to him. If there were numerous gods in the heavens and the earth, they would have been ruined, due to the gods disputing in the kingdom. But the reality is not like this. So Allah, Lord of the throne, is pure of the lie the idolaters describe him with, namely that he has partners. 
Surat al Anbiya, 22. So, had there been other gods besides Allah, the heavens and earth would have been ruined. With a truth to follow their desires, the heavens and earth, and all those who are therein would have been ruined. In fact, we have given them their reminder, but they are averse to their reminder. If Allah was to have let matters run and arranged them in accordance to their desires, the heavens, earth and all their inhabitants would fall into ruin due to their ignorance of the outcome of matters, and their inability to differentiate between good and bad plans. Surat al-Mumin 71